Perhaps growing up, your parents or your teachers reminded you something that you already know simply by looking in the mirror, provided you have good eyesight. And that is that when you look in the mirror, you notice you have two of these and one of these. Yes, two of these and one of these. Oh, and two of these. And these two, along with these two, can change your world as long as you can keep this one closed long enough for these two and these two to work. Yep, it's an absolute fact. Two eyes, two ears, one mouth. Almost every human I know. Two eyes, two ears, one mouth. Which means we have four to one odds of gathering information, of becoming more aware through input than output. Now, if that seems revolutionary to you, imagine the level of awareness that can change in your life when you use the receptacles for input to see and to hear rather than the one for talking just to share your ideas. Now, I know that seems ironic coming from a guy who loves to talk, to, to podcast and to do videos and to stand on stage and I love it. I feel like it's what I'm called to, but listening and observing is so much more important, especially as a precursor to talking. Welcome to Leading Leaders Podcast. Five minute videos, five days a week. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast. This weekend I had an opportunity to engage in what was billed on Facebook as an event uh, for West Texas Empowerment. The event was called The Debate Between the Trump Supporter and the Biden Supporter. And I thought, I don't know why they're inviting me to do this because I am not a radically political person. I am a diehard patriot. I love America. I love everything American about America. I've been around the world and seen the influence of America from a positive standpoint all over the world. Unfortunately, I've also seen some of the negative influence of America all over the world. So when I was invited to be a part of this debate, I was a little bit reluctant to even participate because I'm not a hero or a champion for Donald J. Trump. That, that's not my thing. But I also spent this last weekend at a patriotic pep rally, providing the lights and the sounds and the video system or the audio system for this patriotic pep rally, where people stood along the side of the highway with their American flags and they waved them and some had Trump flags and they waved them and they waved at the cars that they combined, they honked and they, they sang American songs and a couple of local candidates came up and spoke and a, a young boy that had been beaten up for his uh, wearing his Trump hat at school spoke, and it, it was an endearing few days, and it was a great bunch of people, and we had a good time. Uh, but during this debate, I had an opportunity to engage with someone from Las Vegas who has uh, remarried, and she has a multiracial family. So she has a son who is black and Hawaiian, and a son who is Caucasian. Two boys, same age, stepbrothers, live in the same household, hang out together, and the two of them got into mischief together. They both got a citation from the officer, exactly the same citation. They both were sent a letter from the court to appear about the issue. One of them, the case was completely dismissed before he even appeared in court, and the other one had to stand before the judge and explain his presence in the place where he got the ticket. Now, that doesn't seem unusual, except that the irony of the whole thing is that the only one who was actually called to court was the black son. And so when mom went to court, she took her white son and her black son, and she stood before the judge and she said, help me understand why only my child of color has been singled out to come to court. The judge replied, because our system is broken. Now, I can't go any further than that, other than to say, <clears throat> when we talk about systemic racism, some of the things I see and hear described as systemic racism, I go, no, I don't think that's what that is. I, I think maybe you're using the term wrong, or maybe you misunderstand what systemic racism looked like. But that instance, that, that my friends, is systemic racism. There, there's no other way to define it. That is a moment in that conversation, in this debate, that I had to say, you know what? I take your side. I agree 100%. 
There's something wrong with that moment. There's something wrong with the idea that because of the color of your skin, justice doesn't apply to you. Because of the color of your skin, the way the judge or the officer or your neighbor treats you should be different. That, my friends, is wrong. It's morally wrong. It's legally wrong. It's not justice in any stretch of the imagination. I love the way Martin Luther King Jr. said it when he said, I, I want to know that one day my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And the, true should, the same thing should be truly said of white people as well, and Asian people, and Hispanic people, and black people, and European people, and African people of any skin color, Middle Eastern people of any skin color, any tone. We should all be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. Not the nation we came from, but the way we treat one another. I believe they call that the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's not that complicated. But it is hard to do with this when you disengage these and these. When you don't look, when you don't listen, and you only want to talk, odds are you're not going to learn anything. I'll never forget sitting across from a young man with the last name of Campbell at a Starbucks. And he looked at me and he said, honestly, why is it that there are so many laws against an article of clothing? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, now, when I shared that in the debate, just a little aside, during the conversation, I made that same comment. And I said, it was, a, it was an aha moment for me. It was a light bulb on moment for me when he said, why do you outlaw an article of clothing? That question itself seemed puzzling to me. I didn't get it. I didn't know what it meant. But as he explained to me that in many communities, just wearing a hoodie can have you thrown out of a building. Just wearing a hoodie can keep you banned from going into certain buildings. And the target obviously isn't the hoodie any more than it might be a spoon because the hoodie is just an article of clothing. But it is a direct association to a certain culture, a certain group of people. Generally speaking, young people, 18 to 25 years old, and generally speaking, an African-American community. So if you're banned from coming into a building because of your hoodie, is that just another way of saying, if you're black, you're not welcome? I'm just asking. But see, that question caused an awareness because I listened to what he said and the heartache that goes behind it. And during that season, I had a coaching client from Ghana and her family is very dark skinned and she said both of my boys are in college but they're both very tall boys and their dad is a very thick man a very dark skinned very deep voice I've never met the boys but she said I'm terrified when they just go to 7-eleven that they may not come back alive because they will not stop wearing their hoodies and they love to have them pulled down over their face with their draws team pulled tight which means you can't see what they're up to you can barely see their little noses sticking out she said but that scares me because other people instantly are afraid of them, instantly are judging them as bad people. They don't know who they, am, who they are. They don't know that I'm a surgeon and so is their father. They don't know anything about us. They just know they're dark skinned, they have deep voices, they're big and imposing, and they're wearing hoodies and that makes them suspect. My friends, again, I agree, she's right. That should not be how we decide if someone is good, bad, or otherwise. Content of the character. Now there are some signs, some symbols, some behaviors, some gang signs, uh, some guns, some drugs that are usually dead giveaways. This is probably not where you should be hanging out and you should probably avoid those kind of people. That's not because of the color of their skin. It's because of the choice of their behavior based on the content of their character. Again, listen and watch. Observe. Don't talk. There's so much more to be learned that way. But let me close with this because this was probably one of the biggest aha moments. I experienced it a few years ago, but I shared it in this debate yesterday. And at the end of the debate, and I've, I've shared it on my Facebook page, I think you'll find that there was a whole lot more agreement than there was disagreement. Strange, huh? But I remember the moment that I was talking about Mayberry. It's a country song. And the country song refers to a little town, a uh, fictitious Hollywood town, that was in the, the show Andy Griffith. And in the Andy Griffith show, 
It was one of the, it was those days when you could hearken back to leaving your front door unlocked. I remember growing up in the late 60s and early 70s in a small town in central Texas. And I know for a fact there were nights that my mother never even closed the front door. If the screen was closed, we were good. I know for a fact there were times that my aunt and uncle would leave the keys to their car in the ignition in the driveway overnight, sometimes with the windows down and the car would still be there in the morning. I don't think there are many places you can do that in today's world. I wouldn't do it in today's world. I barely walk from the house to the car without locking the house or locking the car. And it's not because I don't trust people. It's just that, well, I don't trust people. That's a sad state of affairs. I hearken back to that day and I think, what what would happen if we had that simple life again where we could just trust our neighbors and not be suspicious of everybody and everything? But as I was talking to this gentleman about the idea of Mayberry, about going back to the 50s and 60s when life was so simple and, and everybody got along and, you know, Aunt B would show up with her apple pie, he asked me a question that shook my world. He said, where was the black guy? I said, what? He said, where was the black guy in the Andy Griffith show? Huh, I, I don't know. He said, my problem with Make America Great Again is that there are many people who have a nostalgic view of the 50s and 60s, that it was an awesome time and everything was innocent and kids could run up and down the street and play until the street lights came on and it was all awesome. He said, the problem with it is it's an idyllic look in a fantasy land that only some people got to live. But if you look at Mayberry, there's no black family. And if there was, how were they treated? Who were they? What kind of people were they? What kind of job did he have? Did they go to the same schools? Because the truth is they didn't. They were treated differently. They were seen differently. They were isolated differently. And when I think about my ideal world, oh yeah, I'd love to be able to leave my keys in the ignition of my car and not worry about somebody stealing it. That'd be awesome. Uh, but I also don't want my friends, my brothers and sisters of color to not enjoy the same sense of peace, family quality, the time together, when only one parent had to work in order to make a living. Right? Choose, male or female, I don't care if it's the husband or the wife that works. But we shouldn't be in a state of affairs where it demands that everybody in the house have a job just to keep the lights on. I think we had a great conversation. We talked about gun control, we talked about education, whether it should be free or not. We talked about uh, personality versus policy. I think you should go watch the interview, personally. I, I think it was pretty good. Uh, four people on the interview. Uh, I was the only one that was not a person of color and the only one that was male. I thought it was pretty interesting. Maybe you'll enjoy it too. But I want you to take some time as leaders and ask yourself, wherever you are in the world, wherever you are in your politics, wherever you are in your religion, do you spend more time talking or more time listening and watching? Because you got four of these to one of these. Take time for the input, not just the output. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom.